Hello and welcome to the Raw Review. I'm Michael Anthony from What Culture, and I'm joined by Michael Sidgwick from What Culture to discuss everything that happened on last night's wonderful edition of the flagship. But first, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure to subscribe to What Culture Rest on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube <sighs> for daily wrestling podcasts. We'll not only preview and review Monday Night Raw, but also Friday Night SmackDown, the show formerly known as NXT 2.0, oh! AW Dynamite, AW Collision, pay per views, premium live events. We sometimes hold wrestling interviews, have roundtable discussions, and a roundup of the week complete with a bloody good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. Sige. Monday Night Raw. <laughs> um, the one Monday Night Raw was that I didn't think it was particularly good. Wild. Well, it was a bit flat. There was some problematic stuff on there. Huge problem. Uh, we'll, we'll huge, definitely huge, get huge problem. Yeah. We'll definitely, definitely get to it. Oh my God, what a bubble those morons live in. Yeah. And that can never be popped, unfortunately for me. Um, yeah, I didn't think this was, this was particularly good. Um, I never thought I would say this in a million years, like ever. I mean, they say never say never in this beer. They do say they, they say sure never, do. never, never. They like to say it a lot. Um, they had a better handle on a three-hour raw. These two-hour raws... It feels like something's missing. Yep. To quote Frank Costanza, something's missing. I thought this was oh, um, no, God no, Jesus no, it was brilliant. But no, it wasn't. Was, though, was it? Uh, it was. I thought it was very good. Really, I did. Yeah, I thought it was um, like genuinely. Yeah, yeah, genuinely. Ah. A much better exhibition of how to use two hours as opposed to the. You can't really count last week because it was tape, but the first week where it did feel like there was this. Attempt to squash a three-hour show into two. Squash. It didn't work. Everybody suffered. You know, just, just, just too many stars. And um, it should be a selection headache. But right now, they find themselves in this, obviously, this difficult holding pattern before Netflix. I just cannot see them staying two. I know there's still discussion over what it's going to be, two hours, two and a half hours. They were like, oh, we can kind of go whatever we want. If I'm them but, and the SmackDown's going three, I'll just keep it two. Let's not take the piss. Of course, yeah, because SmackDown's going to be Let's three. Let's not take the piss. Well, that's on where the finally the uppers and the downers. That's not on Netflix, is it? You can do what you want on Netflix. Yeah, but like, no, nah, nah, I just think that if it's about AEW, but to talk about AEW, like, too much content is bad. Too much content is bad. Um, if they do three three hour weekly shows, it could expose, it could alienate, it could bore people. Um, AEW is a million problems. If you go to whatculture.com slash WWE imminently, you will find an editorial written by myself about those problems and potential fixes. Um, but uh, there's so many, but one of them, one of the many is the addition of Collision and expanding that pay-per-view schedule. It just doesn't feel premium. doesn't mm. feel like I can't wait for the next one. hasn't felt like that in quite some time. Uh, WWE runs at risk genuinely keep Raw two hours. If I'm Levesque, and thank God I'm not. He's just never figured That's it out. That's what I'm doing. This is the TV time he's yet to... Prove himself with creative mm. lazy, so we'll see. Um, it starts hot, at least this week. Um, you get the usual um, thing of people arriving to work, but it's broken up almost instantly because the first person to arrive is Bronson Reed, and he is decked by Seth Rollins. Yeah, they keep doing that one. He takes him out of the suitcase. You're right, it is good. Um, and didn't didn't. So I, I just when you said they keep doing it, I thought you meant it's because it's just so awesome and they get such an amazing reaction. Like they just why not go back to the well? I don't know how you feel when you watch it. Anyway, he decks him, he, like sort of races out to the ring pretty much, calls him out for a fight right now. You then see like a security guard fly out the entrance tunnel. Uh, Bronson Reed, there's loads of bodies again, but Bronson Reed... A little just, Lance Archer, that, isn't it? Yeah. Aye, that's a, it. Bit of a rip wife. That same sort of effect, yeah. Uh, they did it with a rock as well, didn't they, with uh, Jey Uso earlier this year? So like there's that little gap in time before he arrives. All his security around just keeps barging them away. Um, Rollins, to be fair, like immediately just starts to fight again. He doesn't like wait for Bronson Reed to arrive with all these security around him. He dives onto a lot of them. Uh, the pile scatters for a little bit. They sort of work their way around to the table where um, Seth is sort of half. He's not on the table properly. He's just sort of lent half over it. Uh, Bronson Reed manages to like fling a security guard into other security guards. I like it when you throw people at people to knock down people. The simple same, no, no, same, it same, same, cool. same, same. He gets on the little bit of the barricade where the announcer normally sits and then he jumps onto Seth. Seth moves out the way and the table just explodes. Bits of the table go everywhere. Oh my God. And, uh, <laughs> and they do need to be separated. There will be more on that later, but what did you... Uh, we talked this about this yesterday. I think explosive was the word we used. The sense that it, this needed to feel explosive to continue that momentum that kicked all this off. Do you think they managed that in this opening? It doesn't have the same effect as Reed versus Strowman. Um, you know, it, it, it's basically they've stumbled upon a little trick with mm -hmm. which Bronson Reed becomes less painful to watch. Yes. 
with his like sometimes unbelievably terrible selling and that flailing armor. <laughs> um, and his it, it you, chaos can't become formula. Yeah, like this uncontrollable monster doing the same things every single week. You know, it, it, it's meant to be chaotic, not mm. just the thing that somebody does. Like normality, I don't know if it's the opposite of chaos, but uh, it's pretty antithetical. Yeah. Um, so I was a bit like, I've uh, seen it. He can't really uh, contrive this sort of thing that often. And then there's a bit of debris mm. flies almost in my face yes. into the camera. And it just looked like a literal explosion. That bit looked awesome. I think that just a little bit of cardboard with a dream did an unbelievable job of making it seem like that's not supposed to happen. Yeah. Those bits don't usually fly like that. This has not been rehearsed or whatever. Uh, I'm not being facetious. That bit was awesome. Mm-hmm. It felt like the carnage. It felt like explosions are meant to look like completely wildly it's different every like single time. It wasn't really hauled onto it, was yeah. it? It was like opportunistic almost. To if, I'm not being funny, like I'm not being facetious. If that bit of like panel or whatever doesn't fly in the way it does, I'm watching this thing and someone just got put through a table or whatever. It happens every single week since Survivor Series 1995. <laughs> but that was pretty cool at yeah. the moment. Um, look, and it's still pretty hot in the building. Like, aye. Bronson Reed still feels like a bigger deal than he did, what, two, three months ago. Mm-hmm. So, aye, no, pretty the, the, match okay. will, the match will be a test. They will announce that later on as well. We've got a, a quick backstage segment where um, Damage Katal are prepping for Lash Legend and Jakara Jackson. We then get Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez, who enter the shot, um, to remind everybody that, obviously, it's going to be Liv and Naya at uh, Crown Jewel. But in the meantime, they'll want to fight tonight. Um, and Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez are ready to give them that. So they're going to have a tag team match. Damage Katala obviously got the match on NXT, which you can uh, hear us preview wherever you get your podcast now on the NXT preview. Um, we then go to uh, ringside where Joe Testator announces that Samantha Irvin has left WWE. Um, it's sort of a, a, a pleasant farewell. It's not a future endeavours type message. There doesn't seem to be any cynicism attached to just like... Samantha Irvin is gone, but uh, Lillian Garcia will be doing uh, Raw and Outs Duty tonight. I don't know. I feel like I just saw just before we came in to record that she might have actually signed a contract to come back on full time. Yeah, I think she's there now. Um, so that's a gig. Well, that's it. So what, like, scanned as, like, a nice surprise and a bit of nostalgia for people that grew up with Lillian Garcia. I guess that's what you're going to be getting going forward. Um, so we can look forward to more Tag Team Containers tournaments. Um, because the first round of one tonight <laughs> was... Uh, yeah, triple threat ones as well. Yeah. Question about... No, I'll talk about Irvin. There's not much to talk about in these matches. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Let's, like, let's give yeah. ourselves something to talk about. The what are your thoughts on the departure of Samantha Irvin? Not very cool of WWE. It's about... Um, Outside interests and stuff, isn't it, as well? So that's like, uh, like she wanted to do more stuff and couldn't, and that's that, like, unpleasant WWE, everything's got to be within these four walls thing, which... Can't I don't leave your family now. I don't like that. Um, I'll miss her. I'll really miss her. I don't like um, when corporations talk about businesses as families. That's nonsense. That's a lie. But I do believe um, in them being a team and them being, like, a successful sports team. And like like a holistic thing, yeah. That every part matters. Very much a lot so. Of other critics would say it doesn't. Yeah, very very much so. Um, especially when they're good or they contribute positively to that, like that overall success story. And I think Samantha Irvin has. I don't think it's understated. I tweeted words to this effect last night. I don't think it's um, overstating it to say that she probably is people's favorite ring announcer in WWE since Howard Finkel. What he represented was a voice to multiple generations and what she has reflected is a voice to a generation because her tenure has been much shorter. But it's a generation that will be remembered as like a very, very hot one, like a really, really cool boom period. For I'm a WWE, WWE on fire because you never really mention this every podcast. I'm a big WWE fan and she's a big part of WWE. And that, that sounds yeah, corny. No, 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 and no, I no, no, I agree with you. I'm being uh, an arsehole. No, but it's, but it's like, it's, uh, it's not... Um, She's not my favourite ring announcer, and I don't even love all the calls she makes, but I like a lot of them. The, um, it's the know, thing, s- isn't it? Yeah. It's always the thing. It's it's the thing, but I also think it's easy to get sort of trapped in it. Well, it can only be this old one, and you can't just enjoy some new stuff as well. Um, like, I like... I don't, like, love all of the, like, growling introductions she does, but I really like the Cody Rhodes call at WrestleMania. I, re- I love the, like, the breathless Damien Priest one when he's cashing in. Um, I used to really like the completely over the top bloodline one at their peak when she would do them individually in about 2022. These when again when the product is hot, I think you notice all so of it the is li- hot. It's 
white hot, mate. They contribute, you notice all the individual contributing factors. It's why people that only watched in the Attitude Era still talk about Jim Ross and Jerry the King Lawler. Yeah. Because they recognise those voices. It's why you even remember certain referees and other, like there will be some complete bores on the internet that tell you that it's only just about the wrestlers. And it's not, it's a show and everybody has the potential to be a part of it. I prefer, as well, she reflects. I'll end on this because I do feel like it is like losing a wrestler in many respects. She reflects, because um, her success has happened mostly in this Triple H era, the first period where people like um, Samantha Irvin and in those roles were allowed to actually be flexible human beings again. Not those Vince McMahon robots. Or automatons. Everybody had to talk and act a certain way. This goes back to Justin Roberts saying he got bollocked for saying, have a safe drive home because what if people didn't drive? Like, who cares? This goes back to like, I know... You resent it, and I get why. The praise Michael Cole gets for <sighs> sometimes speaking like a human being now versus how he used to speak when he had Vincent Mann in his ear. She's massively benefited from that. Remember when she basically just told people, well, they've asked me not to really do the Chelsea Green thing anymore, and then people were really pissed off about that, and WWE gave her it back. You know, I don't think anything like that Remote. I don't think she even does the Chelsea Green voice to get it taken off her in the first place because it just wouldn't happen in the micromanagement era. And I think she's sort of been one of the best recipients of that. So will be missed. Like the, She contributes, I think. She is the most not-for-me ring announcer of all time. Good luck with everything and everything. I mean, mm-hmm. Just hard not-for-me. Um, she... F- f- what's bombastic and epic and characterful for a lot of people, and she do I will say, even though there's sort of a, a sensation that envelops me when she speaks, that I've got like a revulsion to, like a recoil. Yeah. <laughs> she makes it feel big time. Yeah. She makes it feel big. So WWE will lose something with that. For me, it was that. Uh, it just felt a bit try hard, like a bit mm. try hard, like when she was trying to convey. I don't know, it, uh, there's an element of getting yourself over, but then she did elevate everything else, so maybe yeah. not being way too harsh. But it was that sort of, oh, here comes Roman Reigns, and he's the biggest one from Pensacola, Florida. It's just the shudder in the voice. is like she's scared of him. You know what I mean? It's like, stop it. <laughs> I'm like just, I, hate I, was, I was pretty scared of him in 2020. Oh, shut up, man. Scared of him bloody being born for 20 minutes in his <laughs> matches. <laughs> That's what scared I was scared of falling asleep, if anything. That's what I was Borman Lames. That's what I was scared of. No. Not him like that, Samantha. Go on, call him Borman Lames. Uh, from Pensacola, Florida. I just, so uh, low. It just never, yeah. Uh, it Loved just all that, give me the, it just icked me a little bit. Give me yeah. the cringe. Uh, but I will say, even though hard, 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 not for me, I can absolutely understand why some people would like that in your face, broad, like really, really broad. Big. Mm. She always goes big with it. I will say that hopefully this all falls off at some point. I miss catastrophizing WWE. I know you do. I know. Yeah. I miss that for you. I don't miss it one bit in real life. I know, I know. I, yeah. know. I will say that in about, you know, if it falls, I don't, really want, I don't, I don't care. Do what you want. If and when this falls off. And you could make the argument that they're, they're being sort of like, Idiot proof for a long time, even done the Vince with the rights fees and just the two bit yeah, to yeah. fail now. They might be bad proof in that if Levesque starts to just lose it for whatever reason and he black and golds it, he could get replaced, mm-hmm. you know? And this is a, a now merged entity, the DNA of which was built on fight promotion. There's a million ways and resources they can actually l- draw upon. And this, will. Yeah. Versus just stubbornly yeah. revealing yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because like Tony Khan's got that now. Yeah. Where it's like, well, kind of, I think some fundamental changes need to happen. Well, it's my company, kiss my ass. Mm. And so my kick <laughs> while you're at it. You know, that yeah. it's, this is a different, almost bad proof or fail proof sort. Because he's kind of sucking off his family, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's sucking off his family, yeah. yeah. What I'm getting at is that if it gets not as good in five years, when people look back upon this era of WWE, I'm not going to like think... You know that shorthand reductive history you do? Yeah. Where you just say, oh, it was like this. No, it wasn't. A lot of it was bad. Aye, but I, I mean, I do with 2021 AEW. I forget about Matt Hardy. You could forget how bad he was. A Creed Desire video for any specific period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only yeah, show yeah, yeah. the awesome bits. And I'd, like, I forget Matt Hardy in 2021. Yeah. You know, I forget that the backstage promo interruptions era was 
really out of control in 2021, mm-hmm. as early as 2021. But you forget because you've got the my, my sacrifice uh, version of all the goated stuff. That version, the WWE highlight reel in your head, has got these like unbelievably extravagant stadium productions yeah. for like more than just WrestleMania, which is quite insane. Mm-hmm. You've got Roman Reigns. Acknowledge me. You've got Cody. Way all the fans doing that. And you've got Irvin. His voice will yep. be inextricably linked, which is an incredibly long way of saying, I didn't like her at all, but she was iconic. And, you know, like Lillian Garcia, she might be back. This is it for now. Well, if she fails. But, well, not necessarily if she fails, but if, like, you know, it's a situation she where might. WWE realize they're missing, maybe they can make coming back worth her while to make. You know, she's got a kid. She's obviously, you know, people have immediately rushed to the conclusion she's going to go to AEW. She, Ricochet himself, has said no, yeah. just because she happens to have a partner that works there. But uh, well, it's all like, oh, they want to be with their. You don't want to work with your wife, yeah? Not particularly. I don't, and my my wife it's absolutely does not want to work with me. Oh, okay, well, uh, yeah. No matter how much I might not want to work with my wife, she wouldn't want to work with me way more. Like it's okay to sort of have that nice little bit of like church and state, and then have a catch up on your work day, yeah. like when you get home at night. It's quite nice. I don't understand this thing in wrestling. I don't know why people rush to that one. Um, I don't people because they're not married. Yeah, possibly. Uh, Lillian Garcia Who's is in their basement. Lillian Garcia is. is she, maybe why she's come back to work. Who can see? Uh, but she's back in WWE. Uh, and the first match she announces is uh, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods versus the Authors of Pain uh, in the Tag Team No More Contenders Tournament first yeah. round. Yeah. You are right to say that absolutely nothing happens in the match because it doesn't. Uh, but we do get the Miz coming out along, like alongside. Um, uh, carrying Cross as being somebody that he's maybe actually managed to get through to this time. Uh, R Truth then comes out and now seemingly realizes that the fix is in and the Miz is mate, like isn't his mate anymore. And it looks like they're finally going to come apart. And um, so he takes out the Miz, and then that distraction allows Kofi to get a roll up for the win. The New Day uh, roll to the floor, at which point the final testament and the Miz start beating up R Truth. Uh, Xavier Woods is holding Kofi Kingston back from wanting to help, so there's a little bit of that development there. They've advanced, but Kofi's wanting to go and do something about it. But then anyway, he doesn't have to worry about that because the lights go out. You get the uh, the one press on the piano key over and over again. The lights come back on. The Wyatt Six are in the ring. Uh, the crowd are going absolutely banana for it. Nikki Cross is the first one to attack. She flies off the top rope and takes out Scarlet. Uh, everybody sort of pairs off. You've got Rowan with carrying Cross. You suddenly get everybody scatter off to the floor. Uh, the White Six do that um, kind of amazing spot where they power bomb Dexter Lumis into people. Again, it's like he power bombs him clean over the barricade. Um, I think yeah, like Dexter Lumis takes that bump, and then you've got um, Joe Gacy. He's sort of chasing uh, AOP off into the crowd. Carrying Cross is now scarpered as well. So they're all starting to powder off into the crowd. Meanwhile, the Miz, who has been hiding in a ball in the ring. Uh, from the White Six looks up and he thinks, ah, this is great, I'm out of trouble. But then all of a sudden, Uncle Howdy appears behind him. Again, crowd going nuts for the reveal of Howdy in the ring with him. Uh, Miz sort of throws uh, Paul Ellerin into the face of uh, Uncle Howdy, who gets the mandible claw. Miz scatters and Uncle Howdy leaves Paul Ellerin laying. What did you make of all of this? Uh, the match was uh, dog. This match, honestly, right? Authors of Pain... Now that they very much aren't, and Jesus Christ, time crawls and moves so quickly. It's such an odd phenomenon. Now that they are seven years removed from being a proper pushed NXT act, Mm -hmm. meaning that one hour of TV, um, the Largo loop, that 10 minutes of takeover, 12, 14 minutes of takeover, which you could just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You think about it your whole life. Yeah. Where they do like the grind, we could do this cool spot, rehearse it. What about this cool spot, rehearse it. Now that they're in the grind and they're not prioritized, good God, are they absolutely tedious. Yeah. Super Nothing boring. happened. Did I? Super boring. This goes back to when frigging uh, Drake Maverick would dress up as him and piss his pants. And they were. Either were bang up, but uh, incredibly boring then. Am I just. Yeah. I, I have this thing. I try not to do it. The sensation of, oh, God, yeah, sorry, I'm meant to be watching this for my job. But nothing happened. I'm telling you, like, literally. Well, the match, oh, no, it was like, really boring. Really like boring. a really prolonged heat sequence, I yeah. seem to recall, in the dim recesses of my memory, even though I watched this less than 12 hours ago. Like, like just plodding strikes, like, you know, like demolition and powers of pain with absolutely none of the charisma. Just on the new day. 
on the new day. It's crap. Day. Like the Miz is out so we can let the new day have a brief comeback and then we can go back to the plodding and plodding yeah. because now here comes our truth and utter crap. Yeah. Utter, utter, utter crap. Um, yeah, the the direction of, what are called Power Glove? What's her actual name? Uh, Final Testament. Final Testament versus... Mega Glove, please. That was what he had. That was what Paul Ellering. Oh, right. Okay. How would Paul Ellering laugh in celebration? <laughs> yeah, that's how you would do it. If he's if he's still going to be working here, because this kind of felt like a bit of a... Little light bit, off, little bit, yeah. little bit, little bit. Yeah, um, so that direction. I mean, I can't be asked to watch Karrion Cross and the rest Yeah. against the wide six. I thought this was mega effective again, though. No, oh, it making, you know, the seals clap, yes. Uh, the very discerning crowd at the uh, one of my favorite buildings, the Swells Fargo Center. Swells Fargo. That's right. Um, the Philadelphia no. Natives, as in uh, the United States' most discerning wrestling fans, sir. Like, that's what I was told about uh, people in Philadelphia, Sitch. I'm, I'm, I'm the ones I met over there. I love so. the people of Philadelphia. I thought you just said there were seals. You know who isn't a seal? Who's that? Scott Carlson. He's, isn't he the best guy? Yeah, exactly. The nicest dude. If you don't know who Scott Carlson is, he writes the uh, ups and downs for Raw on whatculture.com slash WWE. Um, we met with him a few times at, uh, in Philly over WrestleMania weekend. I'm just being a dick. They're not seals. <laughs> They're not seals. They're they do love the Wyatts, Mike. They love the Wyatts. And I don't, but they do. And that's absolutely fine. I really don't care. I'm just, I don't, Doug. The matches are quite good. I just want to put over Scott Carlson again. Yeah. I, just the nicest goddamn dude. Article every week, rain or shine Read on it. these episodes of Raw. Like when it was terrible as well, by the way. If you so. think, if you think, oh God, such a, you're such a cynical bastard, just get over it. And if you think, Hamlet, like, if you're going to be this much of a mark, at least be a bit sincere about it. <laughs> Scott Carlson is so reasonable with his takes. Yes. Like, so, like, reasonable. Like, I just can't imagine him ever being criticized. Uh, people will criticize everything and everyone. It is online. But, Mike, he's just so reasonable and well-informed and got good opinions. Fair, isn't he? He's, yeah, he's incredibly fair. Just the nicest dude. Wish I'd gone for a pint with him at Mania. Yeah, you know, it's never I'd worked with out him briefly. But it was yeah, it was time was tight, wasn't it? Yeah. We'll get another opportunity, I'm sure. Hopefully down the line. Let's hope so. Uh, I I do not care about the 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 post match and what it's building. I don't care about the Miz. I care even less about our truth. Um, I will say that. You know what? No, I was gonna say. You know, they'll probably do some matches. It's wrestling, mm. uh, and they'll probably be not very good, even though they'll be loud and pretty over. If they stip it up, cool. Yeah, they stipped it up with Final Testament, and it was still waffle. It, uh, it was still absolutely a bobbins at WrestleMania. At WrestleMania. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Sidgwick's conspiracy corner. Let's go. Remember WrestleMania? I don't know. You <laughs> I live with the memories every day. Man. Yeah, I, I know. I don't know if it happened on your stand, but Nicholas will attest to this, our beautiful producer. They shone like a big old spotlight yeah. over the ring right in our faces, and then they turned it off <laughs> as soon as the action, air quotes, intensified in this match. So it's like, yay! I reckon that was a psyop. Designed to get Karrion Cross more over than he actually is, which is not at all, not remotely. It's a solid conspiracy, but I can debunk it. I'm afraid ah. because they switched that one off and switched one on to us, and then I couldn't see. So maybe to get you to pop and to get the rest of us to not see the match full stop, they thought a different light. Let's blind a bigger section of the crowd. Okay, got a new segment. Got him. <laughs> what really grinds my gears? <laughs> <laughs> Family Guy reference. Yeah. You know what really grinds my gears? Go on. <sighs> Big lights in stadiums because they are annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Why <laughs> does this happen at every single outdoor event? Yeah. Like literally every single time. Uh, other than, uh, I don't think it happened in New Orleans uh, at WrestleMania 30. WrestleMania 35, all in 2023, all in 2024. WrestleMania 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah, outdoor stadiums. Every single wrestling show bar one i've seen in a stadium i have had there's this little row underneath the big screen and um, which is like well above the ring and there's like should I just say for the argument 10 spotlights studded mm -hmm. dang ding 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 right there's always one that just blinds you what, why what's it doing what what's, what is it what doing is it serving, yeah. what purpose it's, is it serving why do they always take 10 minutes to like Realize, oh Christ, there must be an issue with uh, one of the spotlights. Yep. 
why can't they position um, remotely members of the production crew, um, station them, like to take I don't know, ten seats or whatever? Right, you can't. You don't have to tell them um, sell ten seats. None of these promotions ever sell out the stadiums anyway. So you can give up ten precious seats and have various members of the production crew who are sharing the perspective of the actual audience that the mm-hmm. production crew is producing the show on behalf of, you know? And they can go instantly, walkie-talkie, uh, turn four, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, turn four, there's a bit of a problem with that big-ass lad over there. You shut that down now. Thank you very much. And everyone can enjoy the show. Over. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what the light desk. Yeah. And that's why it's like, uh, like, boom, right, okay, annoying light turn off. Yeah. Every single time. It's, can someone who works from production mm-hmm. or, you know, who's got any insight into this whatsoever? Because there's some real, you know, pieces of trash. You, you actually, you're taking money out of WWE's pocket because as people get blinded by the lights at some of these shows and they snag free tickets for another one deeper in the air. So that's true, and that's a nightmare. That's a real difficult situation. Seriously, I would like some insight in, as to why this happens every single time. It happened to all in, didn't it? Yeah. It was right underneath the one big screen you could see. Yeah, <laughs> So then you couldn't see the big screen, which I try and watch as much of the ring as possible in the stadium, but you need a bit of both. You need to, like... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do that. that, that that's how yeah. I do it. Like, screen, ring. Yeah. You get a little bit lost, I'll go back to the screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, did yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> do they panic about... You're not doing for or a bland those little boys over there. There you go. <laughs> over. Admission from my men in the stand. You know, why? Someone yeah. tell me. I, I think there must be production reasons, but I would like to know what they are. Yeah. Um, sorry to kind of like, I think that's more interesting than what we've got to get to, but I was pretty sort of spooked by the way at six. Yeah. Ooh. Is it that that you're feeling spooked by, or is it Sidge? The raw riddle. Uh, I haven't thought about this now. I've got lost, mate. That's right. For those I can that, confer with for myself. those that don't know, we uh, we do the raw riddle every week. Uh, it's a retention strategy. And uh, last <laughs> on the last preview, not a very good one. No, we enjoy that. I uh, found a website that was uh, tricky riddles that are a lot of fun for kids. So that's the bar. Okay, I'll repeat the riddle for you now. So you've got a bit more thinking time. You can confer with Nicholas if you wish. Uh, I don't think he cares. <laughs> the riddle goes, I have cities but no houses. I have forests but no trees. I have water but no fish. What am I? Do you know this, Nicholas? I had an idea about it yesterday, but I must learn. He's lost confidence in it. <laughs> Ah, wow. that's great deduction. It's wrong, though, isn't it? It's definitely wrong, but I like it more than the answer. Right, so do it again. Probably better than the punchline. Uh, I have cities, but no houses. I have fo- That's such a good answer, Nicholas. I have forests, but no trees. I have water, but no fish. What am I? And there was a football called Mark Fish. Technically, football had one. Cities, <laughs> cities, but no houses. Yeah. Water beneath fish. Forest, but no trees. How can that work? Is it a map? Two seconds. Two seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> That'd be good. That'd be good. <laughs> oh, we've broken the soundboard. What's this? Oh, right. No, there's a. Yeah, I, sorry, Nicholas, yeah. Well, Sidge. Yay! Hey. Bingo! And that was the one I was looking for as well. It is indeed a map. I would have also accepted a globe. A globe. Um, but yes, so that was uh, this week's Raw Riddle. You can see why it's such a successful feature. Um, speaking of successful features, two successful features on Monday Night Raw now. A Bronson Reed and Seth Rollins, who were still brawling in the back. What's Postman Pierre's going to do about it? Um, we, uh, he'll do that later on. We've got then a recap of uh, Jey Uso popping in a SmackDown and obviously having some issues with uh, Jacob Fatu, Roman Reigns, and Jimmy Uso. Uh, and then he, we go to Jay. Yeah, I know. It's 
It's good, isn't it? Uh, and he yeah, says, look. It's really poor. What happened on SmackDown is what it is, but tonight it's all about the Intercontinental title. Did you get that? It's, it's strictly about the Intercontinental title. Viewers, forget what happened on SmackDown, because tonight is about the IC strap. Uh, it's actually poor, and I can't wait to tear it apart. There's a promo from Raquel Rodriguez um, saying that Rhea Ripley's stupid if she thinks she's getting any kind of revenge on Liv Morgan. The Judgment Day have really suffered from this uh, three hours. You realise how much Judgment Day segments there were. They've like, just fallen off throughout. The, I know they have, yeah. but I think it's been compounded by this... Uh, this three to two hours. Yeah. Because they used to do so many backstage hijinks. And it used to flesh out the characters. Yes, and, true, actually, yeah. And you got to see a different side of, like, Finn Balor being, like, a bit daft, but also funny, you know? And now you get one... They're the biggest victims of the two-hour move. You get one clear-up house segment if you're lucky. And they obviously haven't uh, kind of rushed these things through. Because she explains um, it's a little bit... Uh, well, someone has got a winning record on Rampage. They deserve a title shot. Rocco Rodriguez is like, he cost me those tag team titles and I never forgot. And it was like, well, it was like a six, seven-month period of your career where he definitely yeah, forgot. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, let's yeah, pretend yeah, that yeah, that's yeah. what you've been thinking about ever since. Um, and seen as Rhea Ripley won and this uh, rivalry with uh, Liv Morgan, Rocco Rodriguez will. More on that later on. Uh, because we've got uh, Rocco Rodriguez and Liv Morgan versus Damage Control. Uh, Lash Legend and Jakara Jackson at ringside doing some scouting ahead of that match against Damage Control on NXT. Um, this is weird, right? So they have um, Eo Sky and Kari Sane cast as the like kind of obvious favourites because Raquel and Liv haven't teamed together for so long. But then Raquel Rodriguez and Liv Morgan have to get the advantage, but then they work as heels. So it's all done in the form of cheating rather than just being better as a unit like I thought they were more effective last week against Tiffany Stratton I can't remember it was so last week it was Tiffany Stratton and Rhea Ripley and because they were like how can how are them two going to get along oh yeah you could kind of have like Raquel and Liv weren't baby faces but they were able to do like cohesive spots because they were taking advantage of their opposition not really being on the same page you couldn't really do that here so I'm not quite so sure the dynamic worked as well as I would have liked but as we like to say, it's just a raw match. It mostly doesn't matter because we get to the finish um, where Raka Rodriguez uh, misses a charge, which uh, results in her and uh, Eosky going out of the floor. Eosky at this point gets a bit tangled up with uh, Jakara Jackson and Lash Legend. Jackson! Jakara Jackson! Action Jackson! Which ends up. Uh, and uh, she's uh, Liv Morgan's tag partner, I think. <laughs> <There's> a- <laughs> so. There's a disqualification, and um, we end up there with... A charge, charge action with last legend. Le- le- last legend. <laughs> that last is a legend. Uh, and she looks a bit of a legend here because she... Um, uh, they use the, they were called the Lash Extension, which was the move she did on Pipe and Niven on SmackDown. That's got a name now, while uh, Jakara Jackson did the Sugar Rush. So Damage Katala have been completely taken out. Um, the four heels, I guess, all have a little bit of a stare down, uh, at which point um, Lash and Jakara exit, while Rhea Ripley enters. She goes in, uh, immediately goes for uh, Raquel Rodriguez. Raquel Rodriguez gets taken out, um, which allows uh, Liv Morgan to get a, like a sort of a backstabber on... <laughs> Rhea Ripley, uh, Rhea Ripley counters back and gets her in the prison trap. This is a lot of recap for an EQ. That's when, I'm not recapping the match, I'm recapping the, the cinema and the story, mate. You know, keep up. Uh, she gets Liv Morgan in a prison trap, uh, then Dominic Mysterio appears for the first time. He gets Liv Morgan out of that, but then he gets caught in a prison trap himself. The crowd are going absolutely ape because that's what this is all about. We say that all the time. Uh, and then ultimately the heels scatter and Rhea Ripley has the ring. Yeah. Like okay. this? No, I was, I was like, I just, I distinctly remember the, I uh, didn't do the noises for the uh, Authors of Pain versus the New Day. Okay, mm. and for this, I'm like, Ugh. the post match. Well, for this, well, I'm going to get to that as well. But I've got another thing to talk about in addition to the match, which I've got very few thoughts on. All I remember thinking was, Ugh. and then I, I remember going, off. I swore at my TV. I went off. off. All that, just not that great wrestling. And mm. It wasn't even that long just for that finish. I'm like, oh, yeah. go away. Can I just like do some promo time to build these characters? Like, who are they? Yeah. It's a story, that kind of stuff. But no, 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 they just didn't fear of matches and have matches and lose matches in two minutes and it's going to get them over. So I was, I was really, really bored. Got a new segment idea. <laughs> wow. <laughs> just off the back of the conspiracy corner, straight into the, what did you call the segment about the lights? Grinds your gears. It's just <laughs> what grinds my gears? I thought you were going to say grinds my ah, beans. Ah, this really grinds my beans. Thank you, Nicholas. I'll do that instead. <laughs> you know what really grinds my beans? 
Uh, here's a new one, okay? <laughs> so, uh, I'll, I'll the way you. I'll the way you. Yeah, I'll keep them all, they're all good. It's all good stuff. It it's all good, good stuff. stuff. Here's Could one. You? Wrestling, just doing stuff. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Well, you, know, you don't know why they just do it. They just it do does it. Wrestling does just do stuff, yeah. You know what people say, like, oh, there needs to be some new approaches to pro wrestling, and there needs to be, just like, just a different, it doesn't have to be the way it's always been done. Yeah. It's like outside of the old box. I like the example you used on the, is it the very first Dynamite where, no, it can't be the first one, it must be the second or third where Matt Jackson doesn't want the brawls to stop, so just keeps having it. Yeah, it's it like, won't be controlled it, by TV time or a camera in his way. Yeah, it's like, there's not a wall yet. Yeah. I'm yeah. go back and kick their ass, like, just little tweaks yeah. on the format like that. I don't know why. Why is every, f- and it's no offense to Lash Legend, she's just doing what she was raised on and what she's been told to call it or whatever. Does every freaking finisher have to be a pun? Why does it have to be finishers? You know? But just a different way, like. Was it okay when we were younger, though? Because, like, they were still mostly puns then, weren't they? Yeah. Sharpshooter, tombstone. Yeah, but, like, it's just. That goes into the everything is Vince. Or everything everything yeah, is yeah. Vince, or everything turns into Vince. You've seen it with AEW and like everything's a pun. Like er, almost everything is like a pun. I quite like Lash Extension, because I know it's a pun, but it should just stretch it out at least. Right yeah, the there's a little bit of cute, it? Yeah, it's a little bit of detail mm. to it. But yeah, it's just I was just grinding my beers and uh, my beans. <laughs> <laughs> grinding my it's beans. Five in the morning, I'm grinding beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, I wish Man, this show a bit more interesting. <laughs> you know, it just it just struck me as why does everything have to be a pun? Yeah, okay, oh, that's fair enough. Anyway, uh, the match is mediocre. Ray Ripley, like hot again for the night. The prison trap stuff got over. Like the the I I still think they are, and I just don't know if they can't do it. Just stop promoting it. But it still feels to me like they see an end goal here of Rhea versus Dominic. It's because for AW with the things as well. Yeah, I didn't no, say it's, it's everything a, becomes Vince, thing, everything yeah. is or becomes Vince. They're just not going to do it, are they? Do what? Huh? Rear and Dom. They're just not going to do the match, but that still feels like what they're building. Yeah. Here's what I think of all that, right? When did Dom first neck on with Liv in SummerSlam? Yeah, SummerSlam. August, September, October. So ever since SummerSlam, mm-hmm. we've been seeing that riptide to Dom tease. Yeah. And then, oh, Liv's just got his legs. I feel like I've seen that 50 times. Mm. I've seen it at least 10 um, and kind of getting the buildings the, going nuts for it, but uh, that's just getting away with it rather that's than just actually getting away. Just, it, it, just whenever I see that, it's a grim echo of that story when it was hot. I think it's interesting. It had a well. nice six week run. Like, we might as well talk about it here as well because it's only one segment later on. But in an effort, presumably, to like get Damien Priest going again, they even have him meet with Gunther backstage and say, oh, like, I know you've got a thing with Cody Rhodes, but keep your eyes open, keep your head in a swivel because when that's finished, like, I'm going to be looking for you. I'll earn my way back to title shop, but I'm going to get one, and I'm going to win. So there's even an element of Damien Priest. I'm like, all right, Ray, get, get over it, mate. Yeah, yeah, We're going to kick their ass in uh, Berlin. That, like, I know you ain't got your belt back, but you will. Just give it give it some time. Like, say, if even he's moving on, there is that danger of Rhea Ripley sort of looking like she's stuck in this story rather than yeah. the character's actually living in it. Yeah. Um, we talked about Samantha Irving being able to kind of get over as a character on her own terms. And I give a little bit of praise to Jackie Redmond here. And this... I think speaks to why does wrestling just do this? Uh, and the kind of thing I think an AEW that you loved might have done. She gets a word with um, Postman Pierce and she's saying like, oh, after all the chaos has happened tonight, like what do you propose to do about it? And then before she can even kind of finish a sentence or before he can compose a thought, the Seth Rollins Bronson Reed brawl just kind of bursts into them. And you hear her go, oh, never mind. And just like has to clear the shot while these do brawl everywhere. Adam Pierce then screams at the pair of them, enough, enough, enough. This is ruining the show. I'm not letting this happen again, Bronson. Da, da, da. We'll have a match at Crown Jewel, the two of you. And Seth Rollins is like, good. That's kind of what I've been wanting all along, Bronson. He's like, yeah, fine by me too. If anything, I wanted it first. And not at all. Yeah, so shut up. And they agree to have the match. And that's finally what parts them for the night yeah. with all the security and that. I thought this little bit of television had quite a lot of personality to it. Had a little bit of charm, and it runs actually contrary to my bitching at the the start of this podcast where I think maybe they realise we do this with Bronson Reed all of the time. Let's hang a little old lantern ski Mm. on it. 
Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try again. I'll try and interview you next yeah. week for once. Uh, the War Raiders burn their Viking stuff and want to get the belts back. That's broadly a step in the right direction, isn't it? Like, yeah. I mean, no. Oh, like less boat matches, though. Yeah. Fewer boat matches. Yeah. Fewer boat matches. So no, I actually don't know on that one. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe fewer, I think. Um, I mean, they, they look less like caricatures. Uh-huh. So we'll do that. Is it Eric and Ivor? Eric has got that knee mm. for days. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. If I can, like, strip away the caricature. They both had, like, half-decent solo runs when the other's been injured, haven't they? Well, one of they've them got did. something to Like, I think there's something did. to them still. Had Eric did. Uh, Eric had a run at one point, didn't he, when Ivor was injured? Or am I just thinking of... It would have been great if you can't f- yeah, remember it. That's fair. Um, have you learned how to beep sweaters? Ah, oh, yeah, I should write that one down, shouldn't I? Uh, call it about forty minute mark. I don't know. We got forty minutes already. Go for us. Uh, yeah, sorry, Nick. But um, I, I think this is probably. I know we're going to miss boat gimmick stuff, but this is an earnest attempt to get something out of these that Triple H did in NXT. I don't go in for this stuff, and yet as an NXT tag team, they were kind of great. Yeah, they were kind of great. So I think there's still a chance for them. Um, we go then to the club house. Uh, Finn Balor is worried about, we talked about Damien Priest wanting a world title match. We talked about uh, how he's going to get it down the line, but Finn Balor's worried he's going to take it from him. Um, and then they all kind of have a bit of a chuckle about Dominic Mysterio <laughs> being somebody that could get a world title shot instead. Carlito laughs about the concept, at which point Raquel Rodriguez gets in his face and says, what are you laughing for? What do you even do around here? And he says, I oh, know what he does. <laughs> well, we're about to find out, unfortunately. So he says, I'm the fixer. I'm going to go take care of something. We will get back to that. Um... Right, another tag team, no one contenders uh, match. It's the LWO versus American Made. Now, I think this is where our cynicism about match quality is possibly, the, like, this is the worthiest it's going to be on the show without us just being whinging bastards, basically. Because this is pretty boring. Like, I quite like the spot where um, it's Julius Creed has Rey Mysterio, like, Rey Mysterio is on top of him. So Julius Creed just does that thing where he kind of does a squat with Ray on him and Ray's whole body gets elevated up off the floor and Julius just walks him back to their corner. The Creed can still do that power stuff. And I'm extremely patient about um, just American Made being this kind of like lower card disturber act yeah. on Raw. But like the match was a bit pared back for me. Like I, I'm not saying that with like surprise. It's just Raw. Who cares? But, like, Dragon Lee and Rey Mysterio versus American Me does promise you something a little bit more dynamic than this. It does, it does, it does. Here's something, right? Um, I'm not going to do a bit. The bench face has got the win, as we talked about, by the way. Citric's sorry. big picture point of view. <laughs> it's a good segment. It's don't good think. Segment. It's good. A good, good seg. I don't know seg. what he's uh, thinking about. Uh, <laughs> You I've got nothing to say on the match, so I've, it just it, it, a thought occurred to me, and because I've been, spe- I, I blame him. Me, I'm turning into a gimmick. Uh, he's like <laughs> he changes people, right? He's like, Adam Wilborn like, is like the 2019 like the fiend. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I broadly love the idea, and I think it's genuinely sensible mm-hmm. of WWE looking at 2021 and like the dank pit that was the Capital Wrestling Center. And this is hardly anyone's over on the main roster. And looking at NXT and developmental on the whole and going, eh, eh, what's really going on? Yeah. There's really PWG. You don't like this? Mm-hmm. Why are we glorifying PWG? I mean, I thought P- PWG was like absolutely great. But WWE's perspective, eh, what are we doing? What are we doing? Recruiting these people and putting them in hard-nosed 20-minute matches and develop. What's the point? Get these kick pads out of my sight. Mm-hmm. Get me some rippled badasses, who look like they could kick assholes, asses. Yep. And then the NIL, NIL nil program is born. And then the recruitment policy shifts away from that Daniel Bryan gets over, so let's go to PWG, mm-hmm. build that secondary audience. Anything that was uh, receding was the business. That's yeah, yeah, right. And then you go <laughs> out of the way, you... And you get these rippling badasses, right? And I'm broadly in favour of that because one of my least favourite things, and I've got, I'm, I'm going to get to the match and the point generally. What was the segment called again? I can't. Um, Cedric's big picture point of view. <laughs> this is the big <laughs> picture. Yeah. This is the big picture. Um, because one of my least favourite periods in WWE, like not even the worst of 20, 2019, like the Lana wedding mm. and Shorty G, 
I honestly got some schadenfreude out of that. What I hated more than anything was Heyman going, let's push uh, Cedric Alexander. Yeah. And uh, Alistair Black. And, uh, well, you know what I mean? So it's like, this isn't WWE. This is them trying to catch up with an audience that they're never going to get back. Yeah. It was the, it was honestly the, the mirror image of, or the cracked mirror image of AEW going sports entertainment in 2023. Mm. That Heyman mm-hmm. initiative in 2019 of give her Cedric Alexander. Who else was in that sort of mix? Ah, uh, it was because they were f- I'm trying to remember now because there was it was sort of like statement guys when they were given him and Bischoff were given those executive yeah. producer titles. There was like two, yeah. I remember, like no offense to Alexander, but he just like he's not the kind yeah. of person he was trying to. T- didn't work, but he was trying to do it with Mike Bennett, and that was his justification for the Maria yeah. stuff. But there was like a few like oh these are going to be the matches. I think Andrade was a part of that 2019 yeah, uh-huh, scene. Uh-huh. Like and it's just like that. Just this isn't WWE. Doesn't go for sort of not the most over or charismatic characters doing work rate matches on Raw. I was like, mm. it's just such a soulless approximation of what they think might get hot because other people like it. So I like get Baron Corbin and his work rate run in the King of the Ring and stuff like that. Just to it was just like, it was just these matches that yeah. just meant nothing to me. And it was like very gauntlet pilled mm. as well with like long work rate matches are good. Overlapped with loads of gauntlet stuff. stuff I, yeah. like not so much that, just the gauntlet and like the work rate. Like it's just you, this isn't you, WWE. You're not being yourself. They go to the NIL thing. It's like, right, okay, bodies are back, physiques are back, badasses and just like big hulking dudes. That's this is good. This is more like WWE. And then you get an act like American made, and to a lesser extent, because he's done a lot more, Bron Breaker. Mm-hmm. And it's like you still don't let them just be these dumb brutes doing dumb stuff. Like, if anyone can be Mike Awesome and Sid, and I could argue that nobody can, like surely the Creeds and Bron Breaker have got that animal in them yeah and yet a lot of the stuff like this match has just got that weird pointless polish on it brutus is laughing quite a bit on the apron that's good what's that sound like <laughs> Nerd. That's, that's, good. Always good. that's always good yeah but do you know what i mean no what, this, like, this, this, this for me this, this was, yeah. polish when you've got the most sort of rough rough house yeah jock morons you'll just eat you alive and then this polished structure that just it does not go together we talked a bit about this with uh, regards to the motorcycle machine guns, didn't we? Like what, not that just because it's all been done, but what realistically can those matches offer this WWE long term when when matches are so secondary? Yeah. I think that's all right, by the way, but like they're going to, them and DIY are going to wrestle in their tournament final or whatever. And it's DIY's dream match to have because they're, you know, they've taken such inspiration from the guns. But as a perfect example, in this match alone, um, Rey Mysterio and Dragon Lee, he didn't go through Ray's legs, but Ray did the thing where they hold the ropes and Dragon Lee's dive kind of went further than the guns one. That's not a dig at the guns. Yeah. But the fans were still like, oh, cool, a dive. Yeah. Can we get towards the end of this match? Because there's likely to be a storyline development. Yeah. We'd like that, please. Yeah. And I just, that's still, I don't know, WWE will uh, grapple with that for a long time. It's a wrestling company. So, uh, it's not a wrestling company. I thought it was a... Uh... It's an all-action entertainment company, you're right. Um, yeah. What do we have... Then, um, oh yeah, uh, Gunther, uh, before the Damien Priest stuff, um, so he's backstage, he's banging on about um, Cody Rhodes bringing up his daughter, didn't think that was necessary, the crown jewel title should be a big enough prize, Rhodes is a great champion, um, but that belt and that title uh, has long been established as a legacy, whereas Gunther's kind of like brand spanking new as this top guy. He'll be at SmackDown on Friday for the face-to-face. This is before Damien Priest comes up, so we'll see Gunther and Cody go face-to-face yet again on SmackDown. We get to preview that, of course, on Friday and review it next week. Yes. Right. Uh, we've had a lot of fun on this podcast, but the fun does need to stop uh, because Adam Pearce uh, is speaking to Damage Katarl about oh, the boy. disqualification finish and how he's going to take care of it with a match, and that should all be fine. Um, but Carlito comes in. Obviously, he said he was going to be the fixer for Dominic Mysterio. Uh, Damage Katarl go to leave, and Carlito takes a look at them, and this character is an idiot pervert of this we've known for a little while now, and he says, ooh, I uh, think I need to learn Chinese. I, what the hell are they thinking? First of all, like really, like it goes without saying, incredibly offensive. Yeah, horrible. What were they thinking? Like, there's no, like, it's not been reported online or anything as we're recording this. If this is an ad lib, like a disaster, 
And again, something that like wrestling shouldn't be existing in such a tiny bubble at this point because it's an inexcusable one at that. If it is in any way part of the show, who's not put the hand up and said, are you joking? Yeah, are you joking? Are you absolutely joking? Cannot. That's disgusting. Should not. Get it's rid. disgusting to conflate Japanese and Chinese people. I. What difference does it make where they're from either? This is the flagship show of WWE and this just went out as like an in-character moment. I I can scarcely believe it actually happened. It was crazy. I, just, I, I mean, well, 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 well. On one level, yeah, because of the year that we're in and the fact that you would think that even if they privately held such beliefs, yeah. they would know better as a public facing massive, massive, it's hot, isn't it? Operation. Or even if we want to, you know, be arseholes. Yeah. We're not allowed anymore because the buddy walks will kick off. Yeah. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not an idiot. Business, I, businesses also do that thing where they pre- pretend like, pretend to have, like, moral fiber. And yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, part yeah. of their core values. And yeah. All that. And WWE would do that just as much. Yeah, as yeah. They're being, I mean, they're doing yeah. it with the be, be a star and events. I mean, yeah. it's all bollocks. We know this. Yeah. But you, you can scarcely believe that, even if, you know, they do think this kind of thing's funny. And look at the mounting evidence that has been piling up for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades and decades <laughs> since the dawn of time. Surely you'd think they can't, uh, like, they shouldn't do this maybe in 2024. And it's just wild. Absolutely wild. Like, a disgusting thing. Should never be on TV. Um, it's just wild that they didn't even think to anticipate what the reaction would be to that in the year of our Lord 2024. And here's another thing as well. It's like, what a, like they're even dumber. Like they have been spending, and Paul Levesque in the Bad Blood press conference. I don't see color. Yep. I don't. I don't see color. Stop being assholes, guys. I don't see color. It always felt like oh bloody hell. You know, my bloody after. Pe- you know, people right. are kicking off at us. Yeah. People are kicking off at us because of the you know the representation of black talent of black performers and how they're sort of just grouped together a lot of the time. And, you know, there was this like, really alarming statistic yep. of uh, black wrestlers not making anywhere near enough um, premier, um, premier live events, whatever they're called. Last uh, black male to win a singles match on a WWE PLE was Snoop Dogg. Yeah. I mean, that's outrageous. Absolutely that's the, outrageous. That's the Before um, that, it was somebody in the Vince era. I think. It was absolutely outrageous. And it's just like, how do you go from that sort of Ferrari, which is still kind of embroiled in, or mm-hmm. you should be, to, well, we've got to be careful about our black representation. Let's just, uh, but we need our, we need some fun. <laughs> so why don't we take the piss out of Asian people? I but, mean, oh yeah, uh, it yeah. Was absolutely. Like, uh, how stupid do you have to be at the best of times to do something that rank? So but especially given the, the, the perception of your company over the past however many weeks. Eo Sky has faced this exact... Um, bigotry in the past uh, on camera, and she, yeah, from that guy, she yeah, just yeah, hi, that guy it was yeah. amazing. Uh, Japanese bitch, yeah, it was fantastic. So, like, I don't know, we'll see what comes of this, if anything. If, look, the worst thing, like, not the worst thing, the worst thing is the bigotry. The worst thing optically for WWE is this, if, if they just want this to go away, that basically becomes an admission of guilt that this was in by design <laughs> as a little gag, as like a little throwaway joke. Yeah. And if that's the case, how's that gotten through? And I, 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 I'm not doing this because I don't like the bloke, right? I'm doing it because it's a salient point. Um, I saw a lot of tweets, posts, whatever we're calling them. Um, it's my, it's, it's one of my least favorite genre of takes of, pff, we'll have Vince back in? Or, you know, um, pff, well, Vince is gone. I was just, Paul Triple H Levesque performed as Dr. Hung Low. Yep. A absolutely... Horrific, unfunny, uh, East Asian parody. Yeah, a racist caricature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, the, yeah. We did. His record is not clean. Far from it. Honestly. Why do people think he's the Pope yeah. just because he isn't Vince? Yeah. It, uh, what are we gonna do about this, man? The segment, which sort of feels redundant, but does sort of have ramifications. I don't like the, the Pope. Fact. Oh, no, <laughs> don't have for the Pope. Uh, Dominic Mysterio wants to challenge Gunther. Per it's just an example. People say. people say that, don't they? Uh, Adam Pearce laughs that off and uh, says Dominic hasn't done anything to deserve a title shot. Carlito kind of like needles him further and begs a bit. So Postman Pearce says, if Dominic can beat a former world champion next week, he'll think about it. 
Uh, and I guess we can discuss on the preview who we think that former world champion is going to be. Sorry, I drifted off. Dominic next week has to prove himself against a former world champion. And if he can win that match, maybe put some Save things for the preview. We'll put him in contention. This is it. You see. We could speculate now while we're very excited, but we could save that for next week. Uh, so, yeah, we've got the Gunther and Damien Priest stuff. Prom Breakers ready to get the Intercontinental title back. And that, Sige, takes us to our main event. These two-hour rolls are still something, right? Uh <laughs> I feel like we should only be getting started, and yet we're already at the end. It's Brom Breaker versus... Been on about 50 minutes? Two, so, yeah, 54. Uh, I'd hopefully go another 30. Easy. Uh, it's all... Like, well, this is where the Samantha Raven thing, one I sort of referenced her on the show, they get the um, like the big match intros that we're kind of used to now, and it was a bit like, Lillian, you can flex here. This is not the WWE of old. They actually want you to... So, like, we'll see if Lillian Garcia can kind of get used to that, because it wasn't typically a spot that was given to announcers to big these wrestlers up. But, yeah, it's Jay Uso and Brom Breaker. Um... Breaker just like exerts his physical dominance wherever possible, and then any It's a really nice euphemistic way of saying the first four minutes of this match were absolutely nada. Just drilling him into the yeah, there's nothing. Jail making escape every now and then, but that's all it. You are just literally watching big strong guy, kind of like pound a guy down. Well, I'm a bit smaller, so I can escape and I can get you because I'm more experienced. But it is just that. Yeah, on a loop, bit, really. bit of Not a lot is happening um, until something is because the bloodline show up. Sage, uh, I. I know I can be too critical of my own good sometimes. I did not find this convincing because Solo had somehow been able to acquire tickets and you can't get them for love and money right now. Um, but yeah, he's flashing his tickets for the uh, Swells Fargo Centre. Come on, make it believable. Um, so we know they're ringside and we know they are now a clear and present danger. Um, well, is, is, is the run of sellouts not stopped? Uh, I mean, they have to leave some in the back rows for those guys that can stand and let you know if the spotlights are blinding people. But uh, otherwise, like, punters bursting out the sides. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, the bloodline are there, um, which gives one break of the advantage because Jay Uso has uh, seen there and he's getting distracted by it. Um, at this point, uh, the Tongans appear and Jay Uso has to go and super kick them down. Um, Bron Breaker tries to take advantage of this. Oh, Tonga love is just useless, isn't it? Yeah, it's... it's Kind of great. Yeah. They did this thing the other week. Um, I don't think this was a SmackDown we reviewed together, but like the, it's one of the times when the bloodline have, have, have won the night, basically. They get the last word. So they all do the once, but Tongalo is like holding a belt instead of the once. You can't even see that he's doing the acknowledgement right. And I think they're giving you this every week, aren't they? They're telling you. How's your, uh, got any clown ideas this week? <laughs> like the, the big whiteboard in the office. What makes Tongalo is stupid this week? I think uh, he just does it. Do you think he just does it? He just, just rips. Yeah. Goes out there and hopes for the best. I think he goes out and tries to do his best, but then that happens. But he's, he's crap. <laughs> so that happens. <laughs> and wrestling happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, Breaker thinks he can take advantage of the um, the distraction, but he uh, he drills Solo Sokoa with a spear. Interesting. Uh, Jacob Fatu was seen that Solo has been attacked. I so hate the word super spear. You know, it it makes me. I like it myself. when he's hitting the ropes, but he can have a normal spear and a super spear. You can have both if you wanted. The super um, spear. Yeah. Uh, it's a good enough spear. Everyone knows he's got the best spear in wrestling. Most of the time, sometimes he does a bit of a bit of a shove, like yeah. a hand press. Yeah, but he just hits him at such pace. I think he's. I think they're getting worse. Well, ironically, now that they're called super spears, I actually think his spears are getting a bit worse. No, it wasn't great. Thank the, you. The, the finishing Thank spear. You. But I don't want to talk about that because I want. It's a criticism. Because I want to talk about. It's a salient point. When Solo Sokoa was speared. And that brought Jacob Fatu over the railings. And then Braun Breaker got in Jacob Fatu. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, that's WWE's next billion dollars made there because Jesus Christ, when he pulled those straps, I was like, yeah, I want to see that. And there was discussion, I think, uh, last week about um, Paul Heyman, apparently behind the scenes creatively, having some rather unconventional thoughts about Braun Breaker being folded into the bloodline somehow, and that's why on screen he's been referencing, my family kicked your family's ass. Your ass, and I sucked off my family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there might be something to do all that sucking off all those family <laughs> members as we head into war games. Let's suck off in the cage. Um, a super suck off. <laughs> So yeah, there's a, a little moment of that, and that's uh, pretty goddamn cool. But we, uh, uh, Jey Uso dives onto the pair of them to break that up. Um, goes for the uh, superfly splash, but he hits the knees of uh, 
Braun Breaker. Uh, what have we got after that? Oh, yeah, that's uh, the when the Tongans try and get back involved. Uh, that brings Postman Pierce out and all the sort of uh, goons to try and deal with it all. But the uh, distraction allows Jacob Fatu to drill Jey Uso with a super kick. Uh, there's a Samoan drop on the announce table, and then Breaker gets Jey Uso prone back in the ring, hits him with the super duper spear, and wins his second Intercontinental title. The bloodline have cost Jey Uso. Right, I'm going to preface this, caveat this by saying, and I'm fully aware of this, so take whatever I'm about to say with whatever. Nobody cares about this as much as me. Nobody cares about what I'm going to say and criticize as much as me. So how much does it matter really? Right. There are fans, followers, consumers, whatever, of more worthy mediums than pro wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Who um haven't even got to the point yet. Worthy mediums of pro wrestling. Who Where? describe bad actual films and TV shows. In many ways, but one of them is the idiot plot, where there's a storyline so bad and so contrived and so stupid that it relies pretty much exclusively on every character involved being stupid because they make stupid decisions that drive the plot forward. If the characters were in any way intelligent, the story would not actually happen, Mm -hmm. right? It only happens not because it's like really well done or because there's this really carefully engineered series of incidents that make the plot happen. Um, it's just idiots being idiots and then that. Well, this situation has arrived because no one was clever enough to foresee it happening and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sitcoms before mobile phones were a nightmare for this. The amount of miscommunications yeah. that could have been dealt with, but instead a character leaves the room and it's like, yeah. you could just catch him up and tell him they were yeah. wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. This is an idiot plot. This has been a big problem with the bloodline when the before, to his credit, I don't think this is often, Paul Levesque had a look at the invisible camera and went, we don't have to do that much anymore. It's yeah. so stupid. And he, he ha- it has been de-emphasized. It really has. Um, This is now idiot plot. And I'm just, the whole idea of a match like this is like, I actually started to really like Jey Uso on SmackDown. And mm-hmm. I loved the first match against Bron Breaker. But because storytelling is king, it's everything, Oh, the storytelling here was so contrived and dumb that as someone who, against all of his usual leanings, got into the Jey Uso character over the past month or so, I just stopped believing them because he made a stupid decision. Like, only in wrestling would he do something that's goddamn stupid and it just made me feel less of myself. He, on SmackDown, for no reason whatsoever, when he himself is almost, at this point, happily estranged from Jimmy Uso and Roman Reigns, decides three days before his big intercontinental title defense to draw the ire of Solo Sokoa and the bloodline, who he should know, I was one for Christ's sake. <laughs> he was in the bloodline. He knows their MO. It's not totally for no I reason. I know how they act. I know how they think. <laughs> I was one for Christ's sake. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. Of all people he should know, are the bloodline are probably, if I know anything from the four-year history of which I was a huge, huge part of directly and personally, they're probably going to interfere in my match if I do this. I should give it a week. You know what I mean? (laughs) If I've got such a pressing issue, which isn't even that pressing because I'm not even sure how close I am to my cousin and brother, which just came out of nowhere just to contrive this title loss. Idiot plot, idiot plot, idiot plot. Jey Uso is a moron for drawing the eye of the bloodline, knowing full well how they respond to such things, that they were always going to interfere. They're SmackDown superstars. He couldn't have expected them to come to Monday Night He said it to them. A Raw superstar said it to them on SmackDown, mate. Yeah, it's different. No, it isn't. It's it's literally the same thing, except the claw. It was stupid. This is stupid. I'm genuinely like... Is this not just... like? It's just wrestling. Well, it is a little bit wrestling. Is this just not... This is why you plot things like this to make sense in the context, though. Like, Jimmy says to Jay... I think I need your help. And Jay's like, no. And then he sits with that thought and he thinks, actually, right, I'm going to go. Say, I'm not going to make amends with my brother Jimmy, but I will try and stop the right. Like, look what's become of me and Jimmy. I don't want that to happen with Solo, so I'm going to do that now. That's a good take. That's that is a good the, take. That's but the storyline. Give it a week. Reason. Give it a week. But uh, you can't, can you? Because it's wrestling. I, I know, but <laughs> I, my problem yeah. is that wrestling stinks. <laughs> yes, Mr. Sidrick, everything stinks. It does. It does. <laughs> 
No, but that's just like and that's I, that's I, more stories, yeah. isn't it? When you've got the weekly the, the order of things has to Yeah, but be they don't have to way. be idiot plots. They don't have to be idiot no. plots. No, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Uh, the match wasn't as good as the first. It wasn't, no. But this, wasn't. The, the add-ons, the interference, as contrived as all hell as it was. I just think, like, if WWE is that big sort of big cack thing, if we tell stories, we uh, make movies. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. If they do absolutely suck our storytelling that's contrived as all hell, that wouldn't make any prestige drama, really. No, God, no, it's wrestling, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, holding account for being stupid and contrived. That's what I'm here for. If anyone's interested. And what you're here for is to watch podcasts just like this one and others where you can get our previews and reviews on the YouTube channel, on Spotify, all that sort of good stuff. And you can interact with us on Twitter where you can follow Michael Sidgwick at... M. Sidgwick. You can get me at Michael Hamflit. Uh, Michael Hamflit. You can get our brilliant producer, Adam Nicholas, at It's Adam Nicholas. You can get all of us at What Culture WWE. And until next time, we will see you soon.